Alex, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I mean, I, you know, you hear this all the time. I've heard your voice in my ear so many times. So to sit here and talk to you is, is, is pretty exciting. Um, and and I, I'd love to dive in just with a first sort of question about, you know, you've spent the last couple of years going deep in climate change. You spent many years before that being all of our guide through what in the world was happening with the housing crisis back when you were at Planet Money. Um, right. And so before we dive, we're going to get into your backstory. We're going to get into all that good stuff. But before we do that, I just want to start out with your overarching thoughts of like, these are two of the biggest systemic issues to have rippled through the globe, uh, you know, in, in our lifetimes, in my lifetime, for right. sure. Um, right. How has learning about them and covering them felt similar and different in your mind? Oh, this is, that's a good question. Well, I think I think there's a couple of things that feel similar. The first thing that feels similar. So, so basically, the the quick backstory to to sort of my introduction to finance and the housing crisis. I was a basically a general interest reporter at This American Life. And in 2004, 2005, I got really interested in, well, basically a colleague of mine had bought a house and I I was like, I don't, I, I can't buy a house. Like the last I'd looked, you know, which was like five years earlier, you needed a big down payment that I didn't have. And I was like, how did, so I was like, okay, checking, buying a house, you know, that's in the can't do now and maybe ever bucket. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden this colleague of mine was was able to buy a house. And I was like, wait, how did you raise the down payment? And she was like, I didn't need to put a down payment. I just, I just, they just, they just gave me the loan. And I was like, that's weird. How did that happen? What changed? Cause it was like just, you know, a couple of years earlier where you, they were just like checking everything and like doing security checks and like, you know, calling up your, <laughs> you know, all the people you went to school with. And so I got really uh, interested in in why that was happening, and that interest coincided with like sort of the the you know sort of like the creation of you know the one of the biggest housing bubbles in history, um, and so I was just like learning all about the system whereby banks were lending out money without any down payment and to people with without really even checking whether people were going to be able to pay them back to buy houses, and 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 so it started with a question of just like what changed why. Um, and so the first similarity is once you start to ask why, you know, follow the money is cliche and often people like use it to find the bad guy. The bad guy is the one with the money. But in this case, it's not, I don't mean to find the bad guy by following the money. I simply mean, you know, we have a gigantic global fi financial system. It's it's the size of it and the, the scope of it is, is sort of impossible for regular mortals to understand. But the way that money flows through that system is often the answer. And so there was just all this money chasing investment for various macroeconomic reasons. There wasn't a lot of things to invest in. And so the the world sort of created housing assets for this money to invest in. And once I figured that out, it was like, oh, that explains everything. And I think so the similarity, I think, with between the housing crisis and our current crisis is that there's that it, that it is uh, the result of a huge socioeconomic system, and like that has been driving a lot of the investment, and 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 that has driven all the factors that have gotten us to to where we are today. And the way out is going to require sort of you know changing that system ultimately, um, and everything else that we do, like changing public opinion, all that sort of stuff, is is are necessary parts of it. But ultimately, we have to like change the incentives and change the systems in order to get the change that we need. And and like. You know, and very recently up until like, you know, up until, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, that looked impossible because we we're like, how are you going to keep compete with cheap fossil gas? You know, like, how is that going to work now? The economics are finally on our side. So I think that's why we're starting to see the change. But but I think so that's a big similarity. I think the other similarity is how people approach it and maybe the media approached it too. like I remember early on in the housing crisis, there was a lot of a lot of flurry like banks sort of subprime lenders were starting to collapse and like the world hadn't fully gone to hell yet but there was like a lot of like turmoil and bear stearns had collapsed and big financial institutions were chain failing nobody sort of knew why people were all of a sudden having to foreclose get foreclosed on stuff like that and i think there was a pretty big desire to f to find a villain um you know it seems like a bad thing is happening somebody must be causing it and i think 
that desire exists. Sometimes there is a villain. Sometimes there's, there's certainly always people who are thinking pretty narrowly in their own self-interest, um, but probably they have kids that they tuck into bed at night as well. You know, so like it's it's often I, I feel like the it, I'm not saying like nobody it, hold no one accountable, um, but I think the hunt for the villain often obscures us to actually what's happening, um, and and what was happening was a system was created that 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 everybody that played on certain instincts that exist in everyone, <laughs> you know, the desire for comfort, uh, the desire for a house, you know, sort of that it was, it was in all of us and the system sort of fed those, fed those desires that all of us have. And that's why it got so big. Cause it was like, it was like addressing all of us. Yeah. yeah interesting. And, and like climate change, it's sort of, uh, you know, a tragedy, of the commons issue, right? On the individual level, it's a search for comfort. And if yeah. everyone does it, then you, you end up over over optimizing in a bad way that creates systemic problems. Right. And it's yeah, kind of the exactly. same the same tidal wave of issues. I would imagine one of the differences is um, the housing crisis. uh was very complex and felt very opaque. Like the average person had no idea what a, you know, mortgage backed security was or like, you know, derivatives in the financial system. Climate change also feels very big and very difficult. And yet scientists have been talking about this for decades now. Like right. this isn't <laughs> like some secret backroom thing that's been happening. Yeah. Like this has been in front of all of us. And we right. still haven't made progress. So, well, we, we are we're starting to make progress now, but for decades we didn't make a lot of of, of tangible progress in in public opinion, at least. So, I'm curious to hear your your thought on what has changed there recently from a public opinion and just a general awareness perspective. Well, I think the other thing about climate change is that it's just much bigger, much more complicated system of what's going on. You've got the weather system interacting with the global financial system, interacting with individual sort of like it's a it's global. So this so the financial even the financial crisis was gigantic and huge. It was it was much easier. Um and I think I don't know. I think there's something um, in people's minds. I think uh, it was easy to, you know, p people discount the future, um, and everybody has a different discount rate of like how bad a thing that's going to happen in the future. My personal discount discount rate is horrible. Like I, if I'm like, oh, that's next week, I don't have. I literally am like, oh, that's next week, I don't have to worry about it. You know, and my wife is like, no, next week is right around the corner we have to worry about it right now and i think it's just it's almost like a an emotional sort of like everybody has their own personal discount rate and i think with with climate change i think a lot of people could be like well that's later i'm going to keep it on i'm going to keep it low on my list of, of priorities so i think one thing that's changing is it's not later it's like very clear like if you were a biologist you were seeing effects already many you know you know years decades ago but if you were a regular person it's only recently that you're like oh a lot more rain or a lot drier or forest fires or no no more snow in the winter or whatever you know, you're seeing all this stuff now um so, yeah it's not just it's not just the early warning signs that are are making you know the scientists nervous but you know each yeah, of us are actually that, seeing the issues and that was the same with the housing crisis and you know like there was there you know the housing crisis just happened much more quickly you know it was like sort of like there was a build up of 3 years people warned during that time like there was lots of people who were warning like this is you know all going to come crumbling and then people didn't really pay attention and then something fell and then all of a sudden people were looking you know so it's just it just was a different time time frame though that's the thing about climate change is so you know it's like it's it's really hard i think for people it hits people where like cognitively we're the weakest in so many different ways. Like we can't conceive of like big numbers. We can't conceive of long time horizons. It's it's we're we're really bad at all the things that like climate change re requires us to be good at. <laughs> you know. So on that point, I, I feel like you know you're the you're now the fourth interview I've done with someone who has has been focused on climate communications recently. Um, we talked to uh, Raleigh Williams of Climate Town, who's doing like you know, funny YouTube videos on, on climate uh -huh. change, F funny and yeah, climate no, really. change, obviously He's an oxymoron, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. we talked to Peak Action who were doing inspiring videos about, you know, climate tech and science and then engaging, you know, uh, folks on TikTok around the topics trying to kind of be the anti-doomerism. Um, and we've talked to the cool down, um, you know, which is Dave Finocchio, formerly of the Bleacher Report and, and Anna Robertson. And they're focused on, you know, how do you actually pull in Maybe people who aren't thinking about climate change to to realize there are there are are reasons and ways that they can engage. Um, I'm interested with you 
because you kind of came at it from the perspective of how do we inspire people to take action? At least that's my understanding of what you were trying to accomplish. The, the name of the podcast says it all, How to Save a Planet. Right. Um, and, and kind of maybe diving into that side of communication, sort of action, and sorry about my dog barking in the background, right. but hey, you yeah. know, this is this is podcasting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the action orientation side of communication and, and, and what you've learned from that. Sure. I mean, I, I think my theory, my theory when I started the podcast, so I so we started uh, the podcast, How to Save a Planet, and uh, I, I mean, I started thinking about it in 2019, I think, met my co-host in like 2019, 2020. And now I'm forgetting the, the timeline, but, but it was, it was, you know, sort of like bef before the pandemic, we, we, we were meeting, I know we were meeting in person. So it was before the pandemic. My theory was that like a lot of the climate media was um, sort of in this, like, we have to convince people. And so we have to convince people by like, sort of like showing how bad it's going to be showing, you know, where it's actually happening, which is sort of like, you know, on the poles and places like that islands. And what was happening was like over the course of like all that climate reporting, which is really, really important. And like, we have to like, it's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly important that all that reporting was being done. And, um, uh, but what I think happened was that over time, more and more people started to become aware of climate change and in fact, very worried about it. And then there was a bunch of people that, dug in their heels and were like always going to have their fingers in their ears and be like, la, 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 I can't hear you. It's sort and, of like explainerism, right? Like we, yeah. we've all had those kitchen table conversations where we try to yeah. be like, and then this, and then this, and yes. then this, and then this, and it just, people get turned off, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, and so you weren't going to win the people with the fingers in their ears, no matter what you said. And then the people that were most likely, I think, to actually want to do something, were just getting too bummed out. And we're just like, oh my God, we're like, the world is watching. We're all, it's, we're doomed. And the more sort of apocalyptic the reporting got, the more I think the sense of hopelessness, you know, about like what we need to do. And so I felt like um, maybe there's a, there's a role for a, 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 a media project where it's like, um, it's for the people who believe it's going to happen, but um, just asking the question, okay, like it's happening. What do we do? And what do we do beyond just like eat a veggie burger now and then? You know what I mean? I think all the solutions that people who really, really worried about it were being offered felt like pretty weak tea compared to the size of the problem, you know? And I think there was a lot of people that were like, well, I recycle. I bring a cotton tote everywhere I go. And then I read an article that maybe the cotton tote's worse than a plastic bag. And so now I'm paralyzed with the, I don't even know what to do, right? And so like, how can you... That, but like, there's other things to do besides, you know, sort of like recycle and bring a cotton toad. Do that. Like, that's great. But like, there's other things that, that, that we can do and there's other things that other people are doing. And so our, our, our whole theory was like, let's just actually just roll up our sleeves and ask the question of like, what can we do? Um, cause it's a big problem. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of like, you know, sure there's consumerism habits you can change, but but really, what else can you do to, to like leverage your personal agency to yeah. push for change bigger than yourself? Right. Like, yeah. do, is that sort of what you were going sort for? Sort of. Yeah. And I think and I think even but it doesn't even when you say push for change, sometimes that sounds like advocacy and like it doesn't even mean that you have to go and start writing letters. To you. Like, I don't know, like I hate doing that. It makes me nervous. I'm not very good at it. Like, I, you know, whatever. Like, I'm not like a big activist. I don't think of myself that way, you know, and and uh, but um but I have skills and talents and, um, and I, I want to figure out where I can bring those skills and talents to bear, where they'll have the biggest impact. And everybody's that way. Everybody has like the things that they can do that they're good at. And if you, if you're, if you're a lawyer, there's like certain things, there's like, you can go to like public utility commission meetings and, you know, sort of follow along the fine print and figure out like, you know, what happens here. Cause like, there's just always ways to bring your own talents to bear in a much more effective and much more highly leveraged way. You all did an episode, um, I think it was on your second birthday, where you recounted 
or you, you, you played back stories of your listeners and things that they had gone and done. Um, yeah. and, and, and I'm curious if, you know, any of those, not to just put your, your memory on the spot, but if any of those jumped to mind that, that, were, that you found to be like, oh, wow, I can't believe someone went out and did this after listening to our little podcast. Well, yeah. I mean, I remember like there was a couple that I remember. There was one, there was a woman who, who'd started a sort of like a, a, a store. There was a, there was a, there was a guy who'd gotten on the, who'd gotten on the local cooperative, who'd gotten on the, I think the board of his local um, electric utility cooperative. Um, and then there was, um, and then there was a student group that had sort of like, you know, gone to all these like, you know, the relevant meetings and pushed back against the proposed pipeline um, along the Pacific Coast Highway. And um, I was inspired by all of them because, because I think, I think that was the other thing that became pretty clear and was our, um, it was a thing that I, that di I didn't, that became, you know, sort of a, a thing we hammered a lot, which is sort of like, there's always like a room where a lot of stuff is happening and it's a room you can get into. You just don't know about it. And it sounds pretty boring, but if you show up at that room <laughs> where like certain decisions are being made, you can have so much more impact than if you're just like, you know, posting on Facebook or just like worrying about it privately or, you know, you have all this energy, go to the right room. I appreciate the Hamilton reference. Uh, for, <laughs> exactly. You know, just so you know. <laughs> but the room where it happens, is not like you have to get like a personal invite from the president. It's just like a the public utility commission meeting or whatever. <laughs> You know what I mean? You can show up there and you have a much bigger, your voice is much more amplified there. Your co-host from the pod, uh, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, um, I've seen that she she published this Venn diagram um, that that I, I yeah. presume you're familiar with about yes, you know, yes. your climate action, sort of what brings you joy, what are you good at and what work needs doing. And your climate action is in the middle of that. Um, maybe you want to unpack that a little bit more for us and just explain kind of how, how you all thought about that in terms of the types of conversations you would host. Well, this this is the this is an idea that came to Ayana basically because she's a very public figure and she's like sort of like you know is like out there giving talks, TED talks, etc. And people would always ask her, "What can I do? If there's one thing that I could do to help, what what would it be?" And Ayana's point was like, "Well, there's not one thing that we could all do. Um, if there were, that would be simple, you know. And and but there's so much that needs to be done." No, the, the whole there's no silver bullet in climate change. I think all of us have certainly learned that there's no silver bullet. But that's but that the flip side of that is that, like, we can all be like all of us can be do, making really meaningful contributions to changing it, you know. And so, like, um, so I think she came up with this Venn diagram to sort of talk to people about, like, how do I what's not what's the one thing I can do? You can always we can always like, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, write a letter to our Congress person or go to a, go to a march or whatever. And that's, those are, those are always good things to do. But, um, but like, what are you personally really good at? What do you love doing? Um, and then what is a thing that needs to be done? And there's so much that needs to be done. Like public opinion has to be shifted. Sure. But also we need to be converting our grid from, you know, sort of fossil fuel to, uh, to renewables as quickly as possible. And the barriers to converting the grid from, you know, fossil to renewables are myriad and all over the place and different in each, every single city and town across America. And so you can be involved in that on so many different levels. And so go to your public utility commission meeting and sort of try to get involved there. Um, you know, there's like a, the private sector has a huge role to play in this transition. Find a business that needs to be done that would actually be part of this transition and try to start that. Um, you know, uh, there's like, um, so, so I think depending on who you are, um, the answer is, is very different. And so she started this climate diag this climate Venn diagram to sort of help individuals answer the question for themselves. And I mean, I think it's very similar to what is happening at, at MCJ in the MCJ community. It's just like all these people like, I want to help. How do I do it? And like, you know, a bunch of people come into this community and they meet people and they're like, oh, you're doing that. I could help with that. And and that that's it's it's an amazing thing. So, yeah, yeah. It's like learning, learning how to leverage your own skills and interests with a climate lens. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I was you know thinking about the Venn diagram from myself. It's like what brings you joy? I love learning about new innovation. I love learning about, you know, how how technology can change things in the world. What are you good at? I've been working with startups now for, you know, 
couple decades, like I feel like I'm pretty good at, at, at helping startups and what work needs doing. These startups need resources. They need support. They need help. They need capital. They need talent. Um, yeah. They need exposure. Like. These are things I know I know how to how to lean into, and that's my Venn diagram. And and I yeah. feel like you went through a similar sort of exploration of that when you decided to leverage your experience in media and podcasting to cover the topic of climate change with the pod yourself. Like, have you have have you laid out the Venn diagram for yourself in that? Oh regard? yeah, I mean, I was very squarely. I mean, what am I good at? You know, uh, nothing but making podcasts. <laughs> that's my literally my one skill. <laughs> Um, what am I, uh, what do I love doing? Thank God. I love making podcasts. Um, and what needs doing is like, you know, hopefully our theory was that what we needed was like, uh, was like, you know, a, a, a podcast with like, with a, with a, a, a slightly different message that would sort of make it easier for people to take action. So that was the theory. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about Ayanna's Venn diagram when I came up with the idea of the podcast, but once I, I ran it on myself. I was like, it's exactly what I've done. Um, so, yeah. Well, let, let's take go into the Wayback Machine and, and figure out how you how you got there. So, <laughs> you know, you uh, you were early in podcasting. Like, I think that's another sort of secret um, part of your story that doesn't get enough attention, which is not only have you been successful in it, you were one of the pioneers of the medium and actually created your platform somewhat yourself because you jumped in early to the medium. So, yeah. you know, uh, maybe maybe start there, like back when you were, you know, engaging with NPR, what what about podcasting jumped out to you as like as a thing <laughs> that, oh, wow, this is an opportunity that we should be do, we should be pursuing. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think to start there, I think I have to start a little earlier, which is like when I, I, I got my start working at a show called This American Life back in the late 90s, which was a radio show. And it was a very unusual radio show in that it was like appointment listening. Like it was like, it wasn't just like most terrestrial radio at the time was just like sports radio or whatever. It was whatever was on on the drive. You tuned on, you listened, and then you got to your destination, you stopped listening. This American Life was slightly different. It relied on people because it came out at different times in the weekend. And so it relied on people knowing their individual station uh, and actually tuning in when it was on. And therefore, it re relied on being really good. <laughs> like that was the only way that people were going to listen is there was like a it was an appointment listening sort of experience where that didn't really exist in radio. Um, and so I learned how to make that kind of radio, that kind of radio that was just, just like, we tried to make it as like engaging as possible. Um, and, and there's all these tricks that you learn about how to move a story along, how to hook people, like all this, like all these narrative tricks. And I just went, it was basically like narrative boot camp. <laughs> um, working and Ira Glass, the host of This American Life, uh, is like, I think, you know, one of the few people that I would, that I've ever encountered that I think is like a, a true genius, like a visionary, like he, he sort of invented that show and, and launched, you know, a thousand thousand ships. And so ours was one of them. Um, so I'd been working there for a long time and that that's where I was first came across the idea of like looking at the housing market. It was my colleague at, at This American Life who'd bought a house that like got me involved and, you know, sort of started on that whole journey. And, uh, and so we did this big hour long thing on This American Life called the giant pool of money. And I did it with my friend who was a, who was a economics correspondent for NPR, Adam Davidson. And it was this big, it was like an hour but if you like actually looked under the hood, it was like an hour on mortgage finance because that's what we did. We talked, we told the story of this crazy system, <laughs> but we made it, you know, we'd used every single narrative trick in the book that we had. We had engaging characters. We told great stories and it was a huge hit. And then based on that, Adam and I basically got the idea to, it was mostly Adam's idea. Frankly, I was like, I don't think people want to hear more about that. But he was like, no, 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 they do. So he he convinced me to come and start Planet Money with him. And so Planet Money was a, was sort of the first foray into taking sort of the This American Life narrative approach and applying it to a subject area. So we started a podcast inside NPR um, called Planet Money, and it was all about um, business and finance and economics. But we tried to use the same tricks that we used at This American Life, which was sort of like trying to talk in narrative, uh, having characters, trying to bring humor, um, you know, just using all the, the the tricks of engagement that we used for our stories about like, you know, dysfunctional families or falling in love or whatever we were talking about at This American Life. And that coincided 
I'm not sure if it was because of our skill at doing that or the fact that the world blew up and all of a sudden every single person in the world wanted to know about business and economics. <laughs> I think it was more the latter than the former. <laughs> but anyway, we had very lucky timing and uh, the financial system nearly collapsed. We nearly got plunged back into the next Great Depression. We were on the we were on the air every day and so it was just became it was a very good timing and that's how sort of planet money got launched but even after the financial crisis subsided things went back to normal um we there was still like a pretty big appetite for this kind of storytelling and so that became so then by about and we did a bunch of really cool projects we did this project where we followed a t-shirt around the world as it got made um and just sort of like told the story of your simple t-shirt but like just all the different countries all that why you know why is the yarn spun in uh i think it was malaysia why is the fabric sewn in colombia like it didn't you know it was just like how did all this stuff happen um and so and we met all the people who were participating in making that t-shirt you know and like told their stories as well um so we did a really a bunch of really cool projects there and it, and it became clear that like okay this works and so we should just keep doing this like we should do we we did the narrative show about business and money let's do the narrative show about technology let's do the narrative show about cars let's do the narrative show about you know let's just this is like obviously we should just repeat this trick right um so i tried to get everybody in inside npr to do it and um it was just hard in within a within an institution and i tried to get other people to do it i tried to be like yeah we should you, know, you guys should raise some money and like launch some other shows like planet money and it was just hard there's just a bunch of like institutional bureaucratic reasons that are all boring to get into that that makes make that hard and so then i was just like well i guess maybe i'll just do it myself how hard could it be <laughs> to like raise money and start a company? And I was just like, I was so naive, but like, that's, that's, that was what I did. I don't know. I don't know if I knew now, if I had a gut level, even it's worked out more perfectly and beautifully than I could have ever have imagined. But if I had the gut understanding of like how hard it is, I don't know. I don't know. Like it, it's, I'm, it's, I'm pretty it's so much sure harder. that is what yeah. every founder says always yeah. ever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you so just have you, no you, idea. Yeah. <laughs> you certainly don't remember this, I would imagine, but um, we're going to get into then you, you started a company called Gimlet Media um, yeah. and you, you created a podcast called Startup, which, I mean, it r reminds me, I mean, we're just this tiny little thing, but it, it does remind me of 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 how Jason first started MCJ, which is like learning in public, right? Like, yes, yes. I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm going to be totally transparent with the world about what I'm doing. And that was startup podcast. Um, and what I was about to say is, you probably don't remember this, but as you were building Gimlet Media, and and I want, I, I definitely want to talk about startup podcast and your experience there. And you know, you were one of the first people who exposed me to Chris Saka, who's now you know one of the biggest climate investors out there because he was on your show early on and all this. We'll talk about that. But um, I actually had reached out to you when I was at Techstars running uh, Disney's accelerator program to, oh, right. to ask if Gimlet Media would want to participate in that. Um, <laughs> so you you and I had this, you know, history 10 years ago when you were, you know, this budding entrepreneur yourself, yeah. um, which, which is kind of funny. Um, you declined me, of course, but, um, but anyway, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't, it's so funny. Like I, I was talking to people like I, there's so much, like I remember you know, these, these formative moments in one's career. Like I remember like almost every day uh, when I first started working at This American Life, it was like such a big turning point in my career. I wasn't really doing much. This felt like the thing I'd finally discovered the thing. I was soaking everything up. It was just like, I was just, all my senses were open. And I just remember so much about that time, like those two or three years early on. And then Gimlet, I don't remember hardly anything. It just feels like it was just yesterday. Like, I'm like, how did all this time, it was 20, it was almost 10 years ago. But I think it was because you're so stressed and you're not forming memories as much. You so know was what it, I mean? Was, yeah. was Gimlet a, you know, I mean, given the whole learning and public journey and startup podcast, things were unraveling as, the, you know, uh, not unraveling, uh, uh, unspooling as you went. Um, yeah. It felt like a, you know, a, a ready shoot aim type of uh, scenario um, from the outside that worked out incredibly well. Did it feel that way on the inside or did you have a grand plan that, you know, that, that you really were putting together and you, you were you were you were actually puppeteering it more more than all of us watching, listening to the pod would recognize? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. The, 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 the podcast is, is, is a hundred percent. I mean, obviously I edited it and I selected stuff and, you know, um, 
I, I, if anything, I, I, you know, I probably like I favored the most bumbling moments because I had to make it clear that I was bumbling. And if I'd played the whole thing, it would, you would have been like, it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't good. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they all, everything was, everything was real. Um, and maybe, maybe, was, maybe describe startup podcast. Yeah, for so, us just so. yeah. So basically, so I basically decided, okay, I'm going to start this company. Nobody else is going to do it. The opportunity is just sitting there. We should obviously do it. Um, and so I knew Chris Saka, because I'd interviewed him for a story that we did on patents for This American Life, you know, sort of a planet money patent to This American Life team up. And we and I'd interviewed Chris Saka and he was a big fan of This American Life and I knew he was like a big... So I was like, all right, well, I know that guy, he likes me. I probably know a couple other people with money. I'll just ask them for money and I'll just start this company. Like it was, it was literally, I don't think it was that much more sophisticated than that. I just didn't really know. And then I was like, and then I'll hire some people and we'll start making some podcasts. And then, you know, we'll monitor. I knew, and I knew about the podcast market. I knew that there was like, there was like, um, I knew you needed a certain level of audience to support, you know, yourself through ads. And I felt like I could, you know, most of the podcasts that I'd made had well exceeded that level of audience. Um, and I knew that there were third party ad sellers who were popping up, who were selling ads for podcasts. And so there was like, there was a, this evolving ecosystem in the podcasting to sort of like to, to supply a business model basically for what I wanted to do. And so, so I knew that. Um, and so I was just like, yeah, I just need some money to hire some folks to start making the podcast. And then we're good. We're off to, we're off to the races. But I was also leaving these two huge platforms with like, you know, millions of listeners a week. And, and I didn't even have a Twitter account. Like I had no personal brand whatsoever. So I was like, well, I have to do something to draw attention to myself. So I was like, this story of trying to start a company is actually pretty interesting <laughs> when you look at it from the inside. And I was like, I was having all these feelings that I just had never heard anybody describe when talking about business formation, you know, um, and all these feelings of like, you know, is this going to work? I couldn't sleep. I was like all these conversations with my wife about like what we were doing. And so I just decided to re record all of those down to like, what do you wear to an investor meeting? You know, like even these things that like probably most people don't think about, but I was like, wait, you know, like literally the first episode of the first, you know, sort of, of startup starts with me trying to decide which shoes to wear to this, my first investor meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, that was a real question. I was like, in, I was looking in my closet and I was like, I don't know what shoes to wear. And then I was like, I got to record this. This is like, I'm sure I can't be the only person who's ever worried about like how they're going to look showing up at their first investor meeting. So I, so I just went and got my recorder and then I went back and I was like, Hasni, which shoes do I wear? And that it's became so a, real. I mean, yeah. you, you, will, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I attend a lot of startup events and this, that, and the other. There's always someone there who is either way overdressed. There's not really such thing as way underdressed in startup land, but depending uh, on the person you're meeting with, there could be. And like, yeah, yeah, it's a real thing for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, and then when I first met Chris Saka, I had this like. I had this amazing suit that I bought for my wedding, which was my one suit. Not a lot of suits in public radio, so I had this one very beautiful suit. And I, I was like, I guess I'm going to wear that. He's a billionaire. I guess that's what you wear. Don't they always wear suits? <laughs> I don't know. I never. <laughs> so then I showed up in this like beautiful Italian suit that I wore to my wedding, <laughs> and these super uncomfortable shoes. And he's like wearing his like cowboy shirts that he always wears that I didn't know was the thing back then. So yeah, it was a uh, yeah. There was like I. It's it was it's it was an ongoing question. Um, and then the self doubt and the nose and like all that. So I just recorded everything. So I just brought I brought my my recorder around and I re would record every single pitch that I made to every single investor, warts and all. I would you know I would record them shooting me down. I would record you know sort of like talking to my wife afterwards and like and the feelings were all very real you know. And so it was like in some ways it became like sort of a nice thing because I was like well because I, I was like every time I got shot down I was like. Ah, oh, this feels horrible, but at least it's going to be a good episode. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the producer part of my brain was like, "That's good tape." <laughs> oh man, you, 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 that, yeah. that, you, you landed on the line for your audience there. <laughs> um, 
So you ended up with a with a great outcome, right? Like you you, you uh, I don't know if you expected you would have a, a, a mega acquisition as part of the company you were building, or if you were just trying to support yourself and be able to do what you loved and pay the bills. Yeah, no, I mean we uh, we 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 ended up so we started the company. Eventually, Chris Saka invested. Other people invested. We raised you know we raised a seed round. We got up and running. We launched some shows. They they got traction. We grew the we grew and by you know within five years we were at like 160 people. We raised a couple rounds. We were bringing in you know a bunch of revenue, um, and uh, we got acquired by Spotify in 2019. Yeah, for for a lot more money than I ever than I ever dreamed possible. Just again, our focus today is on climate, not necessarily yeah. you know the, the podcasting space. But um, uh, what did you learn uh, as part of that journey about you know anything else that sort of changed your trajectory from a communications perspective, from an, you know, talking about lots of different topics, engaging different audiences perspective as you went? Oh, man. I mean, I learned that. I, I mean, so much, Cody. I mean, like, I don't even know where to begin. Like, I mean, I think I learned a, mostly I learned a lot about scaling um, and about like how as organizations grow, it's like almost like a different, you need to be a bunch, you, you need to be different, a different person almost with, at each different phase of the company's growth. Like in the beginning, I thought I was a really good boss because I'd been the boss at Planet Money and people liked me and I liked them and it was like pretty, and I, and mostly I was the editor and people trusted me because I generally made their stories better and um, and it was fun and like so it was like very collaborative and it was much a team i was like the team captain i wasn't like the boss but i thought i was the boss but then as a ceo of, of, a, of a growing company you can be that for 10 people 20 people but once you get past 20 people need more structure and i was and i'd always been sort of anti-structure i was like who needs rules who needs you know what do we got an org chart and then i woke up and i was like holy shit we need an org chart <laughs> like you know um so uh so i think and i was just always behind how big we were and 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 also like how i looked and how the company looked from the outside like in the very first in the very beginning you know you people come in to the office and it was like a this dusty you know, crap hole with like, you know, like with like uh, broken furniture. And like, we, it was like, it was like, it was a startup incubator in downtown Brooklyn that was like, basically looked like the attic of a, of a used furniture store. You know, it's just like all this like old furniture everywhere. And we had a table at one of these places. Um, and so the, you couldn't walk into that and not know that we were a startup. Like we had a, we had a studio that we, that Matt built himself. My, my co-founder Matt built himself with his bare hands. Um, so uh and it's smelled like of you know of like glue and you know adhesive and stuff so like we and then we raised another round and moved into a different building and then all of a sudden we look like oh we look like a real company but in my mind we're the same exact startup that we've always been but we look different and i and i just wasn't aware of that and like how that that sets an expectation that i as a leader have to deliver now to the staff that are coming on board and um, and, and, and you got to the point where like the the staff was unionized, like it was a it was a full on management sort of function at, at a certain point. Right. Yeah. And we'd, we'd hired we had a head of HR and stuff and we were trying to stay ahead of it. But for me, I think my big mistake was not realizing how careful I really should have been to try to make sure that as people came on board, you know, there was a, there was a place for them. There was a, there was like, a you know, they, they had, un, they were, they understood what the mission was. Um, and it, it, you know, we, we, try, we tried and we, I think we did an okay job, but like, it's, you just, I found it, it sort of impossible to, to stay ahead of. And I didn't realize how important that was. You know, I didn't realize like how, um, I can't get by with like the same, you know, sort of like, it's all cool, dude, you know, mentality that I had, that's just, that doesn't cut it, you know, and, and, and what people needed out of me was, was different than what I was delivering. And I feel like one of the interesting sort of parallels also to climate is, 
you presumably had a very impassioned workforce, people who were yeah. there realizing they had a platform, they had a mission, they had a reason for coming into work every day that was maybe bigger than themselves. Um, and, you know, much like people who work in climate, again, kind of pulling, you know, grabbing your own personal agency and doing something sort of bigger than yourself around it. Um, you know, you all had some some challenges there as well. Uh, and, you know, there was some history with the Reply All podcast and, you know, some backlash of the staff on various practices. Like anything you can share about that, that that you feel sort of harnesses that sort of um, personal agency and personal empowerment feelings within, a, a, you know, a mission driven organization that you think is applicable for people building climate companies to have thought through? Because I, I mean, the reason I ask that question is we've seen founders in climate tech companies also dealing with some of the, I think, similar issues to what I have at least read about with Reply All um, that I think is really important for mission driven companies to understand when it comes to, you know, the, the employees that they work with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a lot of things. I think there's an excitement that is hard to describe when you first join an organization and you're like doing this work together and it and holy shit it's working you know and like that can be super intoxicating and that can paper paper over a lot of issues that are going to come up once that excitement fades which it which it has to you know it, it you can't always just be be that you know you're going to you're going to at a certain point, it's going to become the the young staff that you hired are going to be like you know burnt out from working all those late nights and meet somebody and want to start a family and you know all these things that like people grow up. Um, and I remember that from my, personally, like when I first started working at This American Life, it was just like you know I remember like I was the administrative assistant and I came. And I uh, and I was really just wanted to be a producer. I really wanted to work on a show. And then Ira gave me this opportunity to work on the show. It was like the he wanted to do a, an episode about Harold Washington, who was the first black mayor of Chicago. And so I had this book that I was reading, and I was like calling all these, like trying to book all these. And I'd you know done all this research, and and but he was like so busy because it was just like three of us at that point. And it was like he was like I'm gonna have some time over Christmas break. We're gonna do a rerun over Christmas, so I can so I can meet. So we. I, I can't remember how it worked, but like somehow the rerun went out on December 31st and like late at night on December 31st. And like, and then he was like, okay, you want to, um, so, okay, so I'm ready to work on this now with you. You want to just, uh, meet you here tomorrow at eight. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so I got off like the, the you know, the train in, in downtown Chicago, in, like on January 1st at eight in the morning. And I was thrilled. And like, that was like thrilling to me. And like, that was like one of my, you know, it's like one of my happiest moments, you know, but like, if I had done that, like three years later, I would have been like, fuck, no, I don't want to work on January for what are you crazy? You know? And so like, um, so like understanding that that's like a, that's a thing that happens, I think. And I think, and I think I, I understood that, of course, intellectually, but like, I think you, you just have to replace that with something else. And that something else is, is like, it's not just like buying, you still have to maintain the mission, but I think the mission, the mission, I think, and I'm, this is a theory, I don't know, like I'm, you know, sort of, if I started another company, which I would have, you know, years ago, I would have told you like, you know, two years ago, I would have been like, there's no way, but now I'm like, well, maybe I learned a lot. I should probably do it. But, uh, but, um, I don't exactly know how you how you sort of like maintain that feeling, but I think it has a lot more to do with like just being more intentional about like here's what we're doing, here's the deal that we have. Like we we get to we get to work on this thing, being much more intentional about reminding people why they're doing it. That's the other thing. When you're small, you don't need to remind people. They're you're all in the same room. They can see it. They can feel it. Um, as you get big, you need to remind people like this is what our this is what our mission is. Yeah. Alex, I feel like your your next podcast, uh, you know, instead of being startup podcast, should be scale up podcast, where you <laughs> know like you talk really about like all hard. the issues you run into as you grow, right? Um, yeah. The, the challenge is you're too busy to do it at that point, probably. But uh, yeah. But you know, it, it really is a, a different sport, um, I think. Um, and and I've seen this as I mentioned, in particular in climate. There's such a mission orientation to the people who are are working in this space um, that that sort of 
it's not just personal motivation. It's also personal plus mission motivation. And those two things, right. you know, can come to loggerheads sometimes. And it's it's it, I've seen yeah. it be challenging for for founders who are trying to steer a company through that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the way it can come up maybe in climate, and, and I can imagine this happening, is is like if you're if you're your staff is probably going to care more than the than your customers, probably, because your customers haven't changed everything to go work for a climate startup. They're your your customers, whatever they are, and um, and so um, this is the thing. This is the thing about messaging that I'm always like uh, that that I've been thinking about a lot lately is that like the 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 thing that your staff might feel is the most important and the thing to put forward which is the climate aspect of something maybe it might not be the thing that you want to show your customers <laughs> or maybe it's like you know in fact sometimes mentioning climate hurts your hurts your business or hurts what you're doing hurts the actual solution more than it helps um we did a episode about this on on how to save a planet where this guy had this amazing startup that he'd started where he was like um he and a partner Basically, they learned that like all this old refrigerant, all this old Freon was sitting in canisters. It was going to like the canisters were going to rust. All the Freon was going to evaporate. And it's like this super potent greenhouse gas, like hundreds to maybe a thousand times more potent than CO2. So he was just like, if we could just like find all this old refrigerant that's just like moldering in people's garages and warehouses and stuff and dispose of it properly, we'll be doing a huge you know, climate benefit. But if he told people that he was collecting their and he would buy that he would buy it and he'd get paid in like sort of carbon credits so he would he'd buy canisters from people but if he told them he was buying it for the climate they wouldn't sell it to him he just had to be like yeah we 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 just have a we have a business where we where we uh you know we 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 reuse your your old i, I don't remember what word he used because he didn't lie but he wasn't saying like i buy it and just been burn it <laughs> because it's good for the environment that's not what he was saying was it was it political pushback he was getting like you know pe pe certain certain people who you know depending on their political beliefs didn't want to support a climate cause or what was the i'm curious what the rationale there was i think the rationale is like some people were just like thought it was a hoax and just didn't want to do business with somebody that sure. they thought was destroying America, you know, like by propagating yep. a dangerous hoax that was going to destroy our way of life. Um, some people just, it's not their thing. And they just like, they had this stuff and they want to see it like in their minds. I think partly it's like, you're, it's like there's, it feels wasteful, I think to them. Yeah. They want to see it reused. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the sort of the message to startups that, you know, sometimes on, on the personal mission, which is your mission might be climate, that's not necessarily your customer's mission. You might have an ally inside the customer who cares about that. But at the end of the day, the customer has to make a, a, a business decision. Um, you know, a number of startups I've interviewed on this pod have, have said something similar, which is like, you know, if they're selling home electrification, they don't sell climate change, they sell comfort, right? And, you know, figuring out that not, and this is actually a chapter in in um, a, a startup book that I co-wrote with, with a few folks. One of the topics in the chapter is what are you, um, what are your customers buying? Not what are you selling, right? Yeah. And those two things are different sometimes. Very and I think, different. I think yeah. interesting that you're, you're identifying that from a, also an employee motivation perspective and just how do you, as, as an employee, how are you not just selling your mission? Like not necessarily selling what's driving you, but selling what your customer needs to be buying. Yeah. Um, and, anyway. and not emphasizing that to, you know, can seem like a cop out. It can yeah, seem like, sure. you know, like not trying to sell the thing that feels important can feel like a cop out. Yeah. And, and who cares if it actually gets bought or not, you know? Yeah. So uh, um, kind of now sort of trying to tie a lot of this together, you, you've done all this reporting on follow the money and sort of the changing financial system. You've spent, you know, a few years now going deep into climate change. And these two things are coming together in real time right now in very big political debate around the topic of ESG. Um, and I am super interested kind of to hear your thoughts on the, the ESG sort of backlash in the financial world as it relates to political orientation and whatnot. And, you know, we just saw um, Vanguard just pull out of a, a large scale ESG pact as an example. Um, right. do, how do you see that sort of playing out over the next few years? 
I don't know very many of the details and I don't under, I don't know, like I'm not like an expert on ESG regulations. I don't know what they are. So, so my broad hundred yard view of it is that anytime there's like a precise, I don't know, like studying business and economics for as long as I did, um, you, 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 you definitely come away with an appreciation of how hard it is to, um, pass an effective rule. <laughs> Because so much of what we would what we studied were the unintended negative consequences of people who thought they were doing a good thing, um, and like and so I have a lot. I, I'm much more. I, I'm a very liberal person. Probably politically, I was like raised very liberal, and I think most liberals don't see the problem with regulation. Um, they think it's great. The government's protecting us, and and I and I because I studied this so much, I feel like, oh yeah, there's like ways where it can go really wrong and it can actually cause a lot of harms. And those harms are hard to see because, you know, they're masked and the people who are now in favor of the regulation have know how to game the system. And an, exa an example of that, we, we just had a pod episode with, a, I think last week it aired, um, uh, won't, it won't have been last week when this pod airs, but um, recently aired with a, a company called Forum Mobility and they're grappling with um, trucks at ports that California is passing regulation that says these trucks have to become electrified and zero emission vehicles, which, you know, all of us in the climate world are like, yay, that, that's awesome. That's great. And yet the reality is most of those companies are owned by small businesses um, right. who own one or two trucks who are now yeah. going to have to make multi hundred thousand dollar investments in upgrading their trucks. And you can right. see the political lines being drawn in real time yeah. with that. And, yeah. you know, the, the alienation that likely will happen if there isn't further support to help those truckers, those those truck companies make that leap themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a really, yeah, exactly. And I think if you look at any, uh, um, so so much of the way things are, and like if you look at something where it's just like, why is that happening? A lot of times there's some sort of weird rule or law or regulation or something that like is sort of like creating a weird a weird situation. Um, so so I'm so I've always been I I. I Broadly, I think it seems to me that like broadly the corporate, you know, leaving aside the fossil fuel companies who, who, you know, like created, you know, created a problem and like sort of, you know, knew that there was a problem and lied about it and funded, you know, disinformation, et cetera. Like just leaving aside that, but like broadly right now, like a lot of the action that seems to be taking place to actually address the climate crisis, it seems like a lot of it is coming from the corporate world. Like, you know, in terms of just like even solar that gets developed, a lot of the solar, big, huge solar developments, they need a, a power purchase agreement to get the, the financing necessary to build the project, to build the project. The power pur purchasing agreement often comes from a big corporate um, who has like certain ESG goals or certain decarbonization goals or net zero goals that they're trying to meet in a real way. And so they're buying the solar, they're creating the solar and, the, and that's a real thing. So I think, and on and on, I think there's many, many, you know, we know that like the direct air caption capture carbon capture market is is sort of being driven in large part by a couple of big committed tech companies that are trying to like sort of buy the buy, be the buyers you know so all that is great and i think and i think even on wall street like i think you see certain board you know shareholder activist sort of actions taking place like at exxon uh, we did a big episode about this where like you know basically there was a big action on the part of the shareholders of exxon to like you know re redo their board to make it more forward looking. And I think that has all that stuff has real um, power. I think a lot of companies can just be like, oh, yeah, we're ESG. And I think that's there's probably plenty of that that's just BS um, or not that helpful or doesn't really do do much. Um, so so I don't know. Like, I think it doesn't really you can't force. I think you can you can you can design good policy that will sort of force companies to take certain actions in their best interests. You can't force them to care, <laughs> right? So, so if they can take an action that's in their best interest and it is actually in line with the goals of the policy of the planet, that's great. Um, but they're either going to care or not care. And hopefully Vanguard cares. And in this particular place, they're not going to, they're not going to choose this battle. I'm all for like picking the battles you can win and not dying on every hill. So like if they are like, okay, this state whatever, we'll just leave it as is and we'll live to fight another day, but we're going to keep on doing other things. If they're doing that, that's great. Um, and I think that flexibility is important. So I don't, I, I don't know. Like I, I, um, I think it's really hard to craft good legislation. 
So what's next for Alex? Is there a is there a story that is burning in you that you want to go dig into? Is there a company you want to go build? Are you in learn and explore mode? Uh, is climate going to be part of what you do next? Um, help us help us. What's the roadmap <laughs> look like right now? Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, we got acquired by Spotify. I was inside Spotify now, like sort of working, you know, at Gimlet inside Spotify for, for the last couple of years. And I am, and I, you know, just recently left. And so I've like basically been for the first time in my life, um, for the first time in, I don't know, 20 something years, I'm not, I'm not on a daily making a podcast schedule. Um, I don't have a calendar that's filled, you know, with meetings every day. So, um, so that's been like, that's now six weeks old, that, that new phase of my life. And so I'm, I'm still, uh, exploring that, but, um, my theory about like how I can be useful now is, um, unlike when I started my last company and now because of the sale, I have some capital. Um, and so I'm, um, and so I'm thinking that, you know, I learned a lot starting a company <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's really hard one knowledge that it's very hard to acquire. It's really rare. People, people don't have that experience very often. Um, and so, and it seems like you can do a lot of good if you, if you, if you, if you do it right. And, and so, um, so maybe, maybe I'm thinking that I might want to try to put at least some of those lessons to, to, to work. You know, they were so, you know, I know so much now that I, that I didn't know the first time. Um, and it seems like a shame to waste all that, all that knowledge. Um, so I've been thinking, but, but in, but mostly what I'm doing is I'm, uh, you know, sort of like doing some angel investing, just like being part of every community that I can be a part of. Um, there's this community, and there's obviously MCJ, but there's this community in, in, in New York called the Distributed Energy Resources Task Force, which is like a big, it's like it's like you guys have got a big Slack channel. Um, I'm part of that. I go to the meetups. I go to all the different, you know, sort of like um, events and forums and panels and stuff that I can go to. I meet as many people as possible. And I'm just trying to be helpful. I've been like working, I've been advising startups in all sorts of spaces um, and um, making small, small angel investments, different places. Uh, and I'm looking around to see, you know, how I can be most useful. And if that means like maybe at some point starting a company, um, maybe that will be it. Maybe it can just be like advising, but like I definitely want to bring whatever I have to offer to to this transition. That's That's my next, you know, the next many years of my life are going to be part of that. Yeah. Interesting. So thinking of your, your prior Venn diagram, it was, I know podcasting, I know how to make podcasting. Like that's my, that's my one skill. And what I'm hearing you say now is actually you've developed a whole new set of skills around entrepreneurship and company building. And maybe that's the future of your Venn diagram. And you, it's not even media in the future. Maybe you go into uh, building a, a a solution, perhaps, um, is what I'm hearing you ex potentially explore. Yeah, I, I think I think what I do have is like uh, an understanding of narrative, um, and like what I've been finding is that that understanding of narrative does like actually have more application outside of podcasting than I thought. You know, but I've helped people with their pitch decks. I've helped people with their marketing materials. I've helped people, and it feels very similar. Like the whatever the tools that I developed editing podcasts feel like they're sort of the same, the same neurons are firing when I'm doing that stuff. So, and then, yeah. And then I have like this other sort of skill set now, which is sort of like, I know what it's like to launch and build and scale a company. And I've made, I've like, I know all, all the, a lot of the mistakes you can make. And I know, you know, sort of like, so, so I, I feel like I could be maybe useful there too. Well, Alex, I can't wait to see how that Venn diagram plays out for you in the yeah. coming years ahead, though. Hopefully you are amply enjoying your lack of uh, scheduled calendar and, and inbox, uh, in at least in the near term. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't thank you enough for joining us today on My Climate Journey. And uh, it's been awesome hearing your own climate journey as part of it. Thanks, Cody. It's, been, it's great to be here. It was really fun. 